For those of you who are taking teaching workshop, I want to spend a few minutes going over one of the lesson plan formats. This format, I think, has basically everything that I'll be looking at or looking for when I review first your lessons as I'm comparing your lesson plans along with what is going on in your own uh, classroom. So regardless of the format that you end up using for designing your own lesson plan, these are the key concepts or the key sections or the key parts of what I'll be looking for and things that we're going to be talking about during our feedback session. So in this example, I'm going to refer to this lesson plan for an English language class, this first template that I shared with you during the first week. And the first section includes the lesson plan. So in your own lesson plan, I would include at least the following. The subject, the grade level, the topic, the time, the teacher, the observer, and the person who's going to record the video. I would include each uh, I would include all of this in each of your lesson plans. I would have a space for the rationale. Think of this as a theoretical framework. So there are several ways you can look at when you're completing this information. You can summarize any of the teaching strategies or the techniques, even the materials uh, that you plan to use and draw on the courses that you have uh, taken or the course that you took last semester teaching of language systems and the course that you're currently taking this semester teaching of language skills. You can use that information and really any other theoretical framework or methods um, that you have learned in any of your other prior classes. You can also think of what aspects of your own educational philosophy relate to what you and your students are doing. What theoretical aspects relate to the classroom experience. Okay, so really any of the behaviors that we observe in your class, whether it's from you, the instructor, or your students, what kind of rationale? Think of the question, why are you doing what you are doing? If someone were to ask you, well, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why are you having your students do this or say this? Then the rationale answers the question, why? It asks that you justify what you're doing. And it's very important that whatever we're doing in the classroom, that we have a reason for what we're doing. Now, the language objectives and the content objectives, the main difference between these two types of aims or objectives or goals is that one, the first one, language objectives, deals with what students can do. It's their skills, their abilities. And of course, we're talking about language, so we can break it down to either a specific grammatical structure or a combination of grammatical structures. We can come, we can also combine it with uh, just being able to converse a certain way or students presenting like speaking in terms of presenting information where it's informative are we asking them to have a conversation to be able to listen and speak in real time to converse with each other are we asking them to compare and contrast certain items to think in terms of cause and effect what kind of abilities or skills that deal with language are, uh, are we trying to achieve in our class? Now, the content objectives can li link to knowing or having students uh, understand certain things or know certain things. So this might relate to vocabulary, but of course it, it can also relate to the topic, key concepts, ideas that relate to the topic. If we're talking about weather, specifically what aspects of weather are we wanting our students to learn about? And it could also include critical thinking in terms of certain cause and effects. If we're talking about weather, looking at different conditions, weather conditions, and what kind of cause and effect aspects can our students talk about, okay? Or what do they know? What what aspects of your lesson deals with certain aspects of lessons uh, of weather in terms of cause and effect, compare and contrast, 
Maybe we compare typical weather patterns in different parts of the world. Um, but these are more ideas, topics, concepts that relate to content objectives. So always try to think of your lesson in both of these terms, both language objectives and content objectives. If we're talking about going to the doctor, there's a whole host of vocabulary that's associated with that, but also think of in terms of compare and contrast, maybe the seriousness of the illness, what kind of settings are likely uh, that someone will, would experience depending on what kind of symptoms they, they have. All right, think of what the speakers are doing with the language, what are they trying to achieve, what's the relationship with the speakers, and think of what's the content, what's the information, the understandings, the knowledge that we're trying for our students to develop. Even though we're language teachers, we also need to realize that they are trying to learn something, and that something, that content, those ideas are also very important. It's part of learning the language. Both of these are integrated together. The content objectives and the language objectives go hand in hand. We need to think about the materials and the technology. So what are the objects, the learning objects, the materials that either you are going to use as the instructor and the students? What are they going to be using? And this needs to be uh, included also throughout your, your lesson plan. Now here the procedure, what I would do is I'm looking over some of the lesson plans already this, this uh, semester. I think it would be helpful to include not only the time frame of your procedure, you can include the time frame here if you wish, or if you have it up here, time for the lesson, that's, that's fine. You can just have a procedure listed here. But I think it would be helpful in the planning stages especially to also indicate some kind of time allegation uh, time allocation for uh, each of the parts of your your lesson the procedure what are you going to do first what are you going to do second what are you going to do third how much time are you are you projecting how much time are you planning for each of these you know of course things can change but I think in the planning stages, this gives you an idea more or less of how much time you plan to spend on each of these. And if things are going well in your lesson and you're making changes, right? it doesn't mean that you have to follow this plan. It doesn't mean that a, a poor lesson will result if you don't match the time allocation for each of these. But it does show that you are considering how much time you're anticipating for each of these. But then in the moment, as you're making decisions and changes in real time with your students, right, this is then we gives us a point of comparison. We can look at your lesson and what you, what you uh, did in your lesson, and then we can discuss why changes were required, why you thought you needed to spend more time on the practice stage, for example, give a, a rationale, an explanation, and it just gives us kind of a point, uh, a point to compare and contrast whenever you finish your lesson and we're reflecting. Now the differentiation I think is important because it gives us a hypothetical and, and also in your lesson gives us a chance for us to evaluate and see where, what areas and what opportunities either did you offer differentiation or could you have offered differentiation. Remember differentiation means that we can differentiate in four aspects. We can differentiate the, the content, the information. We can differentiate the process, what the students do, how they work. We can differentiate the product, that is the end uh, learning outcome, the product that the students are creating, maybe it's a PowerPoint, maybe it's a handout, maybe it's um, a brochure. And we can also we can also differentiate where they work with technology. If you're using technology and students are using different um, maybe mobile apps and you offer a level of differentiation then this would be another, that would be an example. So content, process, product, and the environment 
or where they're actually working. And remember that differentiation simply refers to giving students choice. Who's making all of the decisions? Are you making all the decisions in terms of the content? Then there's very little differentiation. Are you making all of the decisions in terms of how students will work, the process that they are to follow? Then you're not differentiating instruction. If you are making all of the decisions and telling the students that this is the only product that you can complete, everybody has to do a PowerPoint presentation, no exceptions, then you are not differentiating the instruction because you're making all the decisions. If you're telling everyone, everyone needs to work in WhatsApp, no other app, only WhatsApp in this one particular space, you're not differentiating the instruction. So differentiation or differentiated instruction simply means that the students are making decisions. Now, of course, this is going to depend on the, the age group, the level of the student, how, how mature are they in terms of uh, making decisions, making these uh, decisions. But these are all things that you could, uh, that I think I would consider. And it doesn't mean always that more differentiation is always better. Sometimes less is more. Sometimes there's perfectly good reason for you to make certain decisions. But I want us to be thinking in each of our lessons, okay, this is how I differentiated for this particular group. Maybe I could have differentiated it differently for the same group. Or maybe if this were a different group, let's say they were adults instead of children, I could have done this. But I, I want us to be thinking in each of our lessons this idea of differentiated instruction so that we're evaluating our own practice in terms of how often, how much of the decision-making process are we making as, as instructors versus the students themselves making some of these decisions. Anticipated issues. What problems might occur or might, uh, might you try to avoid or how might you try to avoid them, right? How might you adjust your lesson to resolve them? Okay, so these are things you're thinking about in advance to see what kind of issues might the students have, what kind of issues might you have as, as a teacher. So think of it always in, from two perspectives, from the student perspective and from your perspective. What kind of problems might you, might you encounter? And... Along these same lines, in fact, I might even add this here, what kind of contingency plan might you use? Especially when we're using technology, a lot of times technology will go south, we'll have problems, the projector won't work, the PowerPoint or like the Wi-Fi will go down. So anytime you have any kind of uh, technology that is part of your lesson plan, you always need to have a contingency plan. What are you going to do if something doesn't work? And I'm going to add that point to anticipated issues also. Now, the reflection, this is going to be what we think about, reflect on once we have completed our lesson. And it's important during our feedback sessions to take into consideration any of the comments made by our classmates. Anything that we talk about, the feedback that I provide as your instructor, but also any uh, reflections that you're making uh, yourself, uh, then this is what we want to include in our in our final reflection. All right, so basically these are the key points. Basically, anything that I'm looking for, depending regardless of the type of lesson plan that you're using, the format that you're using, this is what I um, this is what I'm looking for. And I think one of the things I've looked at a, a few lesson plans so far, and, and one of the things that stand out that perhaps you didn't do last semester is maybe write out a, a time allocation for each of the procedural items that you've listed here. And I have nothing uh, against using this format the way it is. Some of you are including a lot of detail in some of the activities in this section here. And We'll see how things go, but I I want to remind everyone that although this is an option where it says warm-up, presentation, practice, assessment, and closure, that this is only an example. 
We talked about last week in week one, the importance of lesson sequencing and what kind of lessons might have preceded your lesson, what kind of lessons might come afterward. And so I, I don't see that we all need to follow exactly the same procedure for every 15 minute class throughout the semester. Like for you to mix it up and some of our conversations during our feedback session will be about, well, what did they see before? What's coming up afterwards? What do they already know? What are you assuming that they already know? And how are you linking that or scaffolding that information? Remember that scaffolding as a teaching technique, trying to connect what students already know versus what you're trying to present. How are you linking what they know with what they are learning or what they don't yet know? So in order to have that conversation when we're talking about scaffolding, we need to know, well, what do, are you plan What are you assuming that they have already seen in a class so that we can see examples of scaffolding, we can discuss scaffolding, how you are making these connections with what students know and what they're learning. Okay, so I hope this helps. I wanted to provide just a very short overview of this lesson plan. These are the key points here that I, I would like for you to uh, consider. And it's very important that some of your lesson, some place in your lesson, you need to include personal things that you're looking for, that you're working on. And this could be in the section of anticipated issues. If you are looking at certain challenges that you're anticipating, and these challenges might be related to some of your weaknesses, some things that you don't feel comfortable doing, or maybe you're unsure about how to do it, and you're really trying to explore those those challenges and try to get more comfortable with doing those certain those certain things, you can include that information here in anticipated issues. Maybe it's also related to a degree in the rationale. And, you know, maybe it's related to trying to implement a task-based learning scenario where you're maybe uh, trying to get more comfortable learning how to make those connections from one task to the next. So it could be a combination of mentioning this in your rationale and also here in the anticipated issues. But what is it that you are working on that relates to your personal goals as, as a, an instructor? And these warm-ups and these procedures can be a combination of things that you do. It can be things that you are, are, are trying to re maybe remind yourself that you want to say or do, but it also needs to include what the students are going to, to do. This is the procedure. What, what, are they, what kind of activity are they doing? How are they engaging with each other? And how are they uh, engaging with the content? And in this procedure, you also would need to include the, the types of grouping patterns. Are students working individually in groups, in pairs? Is it a whole group? And how are you mixing that up depending on each of these steps that you're including? Okay, so I probably will include here also mentioning the uh, what kind of group patterns, interactional patterns are you, are, are you uh, wanting to include in, in your procedure? All right, so try to follow this guide here. If you want to use this format as it is, feel free to do so. If you're comfortable with the format that you've used before, that's fine. But again, these are the key elements, the key points that we'll be looking at in your lesson plan and in your class for each of the input sessions that we have scheduled for this semester.